Ladies and gentlemen, most of you here have seen him before, so he doesn't need any introduction. For those who haven't seen him, I'd like to introduce you all the way from the University of Plymouth, the School of Earth, Ocean and Environmental Sciences, I think it's called now. Our resident stand-up chemist, Dr. Roy Lowry. years and he's only got one. But um, now it was last Thursday I think that I finally got the uh, the outline of today and like when I was supposed to be here, which was quite nice. So I had a quick look run through because I'd said, you know, do you want a blog from me or uh, do you want a title? No answer. So consequently um, I'm gonna run with the program. So it didn't have a title so it's got a nice short snap, snappy one. I mix it off uh, my two teenage sons, so we're always talking about stuff. You're doing stuff today, Dad? Oh, yes. Oh, what sort of stuff are you doing? Well, you know, stuff are doing. Oh, right, yeah. Unfortunately, Dr. Roy Lowery couldn't quite make it. Cue the guy at the back, that was subtle. So we'll get rid of him, and instead we'll have Dr. Roy Lowery. And I blame him. <laughs> because every stand up comic needs a straight man, and he's as close as I can get. Now, um, you're desperate. Thank you. Now, what we're going to do is a little, little uh, time of two halves. Uh, there won't be orange half of time. Sorry about that, but there you go. Well, not unless you leave the barn by your own, but please don't, because otherwise it's going to be too long. Uh, one half is going to be called. Uh, way more half of the space fiction. And it's going to be a gentle jog through uh, some relatively modern physics. Um, in fact, the last baby is only 18 months old. So, and I defy anybody, and I know who's in the audience, I defy anybody to write a script that's weirder than some of the stuff you find nowadays. Alright? The other half is <laughs> just a weak excuse for saying right to things, but I have been doing it since I was about that all. Now, unfortunately, with the move of venue, because uh, last time I was with you, Martin, we were in the Cockthorn, and because it's an old place, it doesn't quite have such things like smoke detectors that work. Uh, in here we do. So I can't actually set light to anything in here. Otherwise, um, there'll be two fire engines outside, and I've already seen them once this year. <laughs> actually, I think about slightly over a year ago, I was doing uh, one of my, if it doesn't move, set light to it jobs for a local school, or 10 schools, I think we're at once. And um, I started off with a pile of gunpowder. <laughs> Oof, off goes the smoke. And I said, funnily enough, the last time I did this, I was in the school, and they assured me that smoke detectors would turn off. But at least at the university, you know, I'm on home turf, and there's nowhere to. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gone past the new Portland Square you, uh, building on North, uh, North Hill? Looks like three ice cubes. <laughs> yeah? It's th actually three separate buildings. I cleared all three. <laughs> As I come out of the lecture theatre, because it's built on a slope, there's a set of steps and there's a steel shutter coming down. I can hear the Mission Impossible theme tune. <laughs> the temptation to die rolls straight up me. Yeah. But behind me are 120 kids and they follow me. <laughs> so we all go out and stand out in the appropriate place and I'm thinking, right, I might just get away with this. And everything goes dark and I look up. And I'm not kidding, he's five, what, six foot four, maybe six foot five. It is the Vice Chancellor. He's standing next to me and I'm going, it's okay, nobody says anything, I'm going to get away with this. <laughs> Two fire engines turn up. <laughs> he quiet, he calm, you know, I go, oh, I wonder what it was. Maybe, maybe it's just a drill. And then the security guard comes out of the lecture theatre fire exit, with smoke still billowing out again. <laughs> Dr. Lowry, the fireman would like a word. <laughs> Said, you know, what have you been doing? And I explained them. Oh, that's a laugh, isn't it? Did you say you did it again? Woof! <laughs> Why well, that? I turned the fan a bit harder, and we stood in the middle of this smoke grilled 150 uh, seats electric theatre, and then Jelly Babies, whilst everybody else was freezing cold and that stuff. Anyway, since I don't want to do that again, would you like please to uh, leave via the fire exit because we're going to do it outside? <laughs> Anybody seen gunpowder? Yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest. 
This is almost proper gunpowder, but it's not quite. This is the stuff the battery and atom people use. Um, and really, I'll tell you what, it, it's actually real gunpowder, but they've just added, got a little extra added something to it. Which actually slows it down by 2%, that's all. And that's what's required to get under the legal barrier to make it happen. <laughs> My only worry is um, the wind around here. We'll see what happens. transport it. So please don't tell the cabbie who brought me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is about as um she puts it in one thing we're not going to do. Yeah. Uh, this is used a heck of a lot in um theatres, which is where I came across it, and special effects department. This is called flash powder and the reason it's called flash powder <laughs> is because pile of it underneath the dark, no we won't go there because I might annoy somebody that's here. Now, um, that's all very well, and you know, these things you know, are sort of bunches of chemicals mixed together. I'm in the area. Because he's actually 
Now, the only way this information is going to get to Gary, and he thinks, he's moved, he thinks I'm going to chuck this at him. Yes. It's glass. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> the only way of actually getting this information to Gary is to take the particle, which can only be in one place at one time, and to translate it across the universe. I do love doing this, the camera really gets annoyed already. <laughs> and actually present it where you need to. So if the particle moves, matter moves, because matter is particles, that's much Very easy. Thank you very much. Next bullet point. If two particles collide, and we're talking about anything from like, can't see it, up to large lorries, well, no, we'll see we're not. Uh, there's two possibilities. They either not usual in case of large lorries, or Fortunately, the sort of things that make up the universe down at the really micro, micro, microscopic scale, and I've really underrated the micro bit there. Because otherwise they're not fundamental particles. They're something you can break down and discover even more what they're down there. Right? So, particles are easy. They're what we tend to think of day every, every day. Wait. Dead right. <laughs> think about waves, please. Next one, point. They only move stuff around by temporarily moving matter and it goes back to the same place. And it doesn't move very far either. Gary, you know what I said about standing on the right hand side? Stand on the left hand side, please. There's more people. <coughs> I need some audience participation. Because you might have heard of several different sorts of wave. There is, of course, um, let's see, there's the transverse wave, there's the longitudinal wave, there's the standing wave, and there's the really important one that was discovered in Middle America. It's called the Mexican wave. <laughs> Just need, all I need from you is a Mexican way. So, you ready front row? Three, two, one, go! <laughs> if that is the energy content of the universe, just pop the fuck. Come on, let's have a bit more enthusiasm. Three, two, one, three, go! And again, I need to get a message to Gary. <laughs> what we do is we literally use the wave to move the information. Nobody's moved out of their chairs, but the wave has travelled. So, are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Get it back together. Cool. <laughs> we just temporarily. Now, of course, what I was hoping for was the sort of thing you see. You know, Whoa! But no. <laughs> so what was happening this morning and why have you not gone to work? You can go to sleep for a while, Gary, we'll be glad to Until the end of the talk, and then I'll wake you up. Now! <coughs> <coughs> now. <coughs> they had or cats? Slightly more complicated. You can have two ways. Okay? Um, nice, easy ways. You can think of these as ripples on a pond, um, waves in the ether. <coughs> Radio waves, whatever. They all work the same way. Now, if two waves collide, then basically the same point in space is going to have to deal with two waves. Okay? So, we're going to, you ready? We're going to do some physics and we're going to do some maths now. I know it's Saturday afternoon, you know, and I've got, I've got the graveyard spot after lunch and the bar and whatever you but we'll go for it. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, this one's at zero, that one's at zero. Zero plus zero equals zero. zero. Oh, so good to be in company of the intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> one plus one is? Two. Two. Excellent. Zero plus zero? Zero. 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 Minus one plus minus one? Minus one. So you keep doing that. Click mouse. Oh good. Click mouse again. Thank you. You end up with the same wave, just bigger. Because one by one, plus one, not. There's a temptation at this point, so I'm, I'm going to give into it. Um, I sort of joke I'm not allowed to say at the university anymore because it's not politically correct. However, it was told to me by someone from Jamaica, so if, that's fine, you know? Yeah? Um, somebody from the West Indies moves into Hartley. And um, it takes about a week, but eventually they discover there is a next door neighbour. So, goes out. Well, hello there, Mark! And the first thing I was like, uh, excuse me, um, 
But when we greet one another in this neck of the woods, uh, we normally shake hands. Oh, sorry. Well, hello, Denmark! <laughs> <laughs> Constructive interference because basically the two interfere with one another, but they construct on top of one another. Okay? Uh, and you just end up with bigger waves. There is a bit of a problem though. Next. Hang anyway. One wave is late. They don't actually arrive together, then you're in a slightly different position. I can't right. So, here we go. Again, let's, let's do some maths, right? Zero plus zero? Zero. Uh, minus one. Plus minus one? Zero. Okay, zero plus zero? Zero. Uh, minus one plus plus one? Zero. You can see where we're going with this, can't you? Okay, go on, press the button. Yeah. Okay. Because one is late, it just destroys the other one because the trough of one and the peak of another just coincide and just iron everything out. Uh, this is called destructive interference. I just need to consider one more thing before I really start telling you some of the things that these stupid particles, uh, nice people have been getting up to. Something called diffraction. Now, diffraction <coughs> is what happens when a wave meets a barrier with a hole in it. You can consider this to be Mount Edgecombe in the breakwater, because exactly the same sort of properties arise. Now, in comes the wave, meets the barrier, a little bit of it goes through, but when it reaches the other side, it spreads out both sideways as well as forwards, and you end up with this, mm, it's not always semicircular, but it certainly spreads out. Okay? Right. So, that's called diffraction, really, we don't care what the name is. The point is it spreads out sideways as well as forwards. Right. This is the classic experiment. It was first done over 100 years ago by Young, because there was a big argument about what light was. And he insisted it was waves. Everybody else said it was particles. So he decided to prove them wrong. Clicks mouse. The waves of light, in his case, came in, you had two slits, and you end up with them spreading out both sides. Now, let's assume these are the sort of wave peaks, okay? Here we've got wave peak plus wave peak, one plus one. We get constructive interference, big one. Here you'd have wave trough plus wave trough equals minus big trough, okay? So along here, you're going to end up with a big wave. And you're going to end up with something similar along there. In between them, it's going to be wave trough meets wave peak, and that's going to get destructive interference. So you end up with a series of sort of lines of constructive interference. Now what Young did is he used a, uh, a screen, and what happened was you ended up, if you use light, with a series of light and dark bands. And this proves it must be waves because they come through the two holes, then they have this diffraction and they spread out. And you can do, I'm told you can do that very easily, but I've never managed to do it because you need to be able to hold a very thin, this needs to be quite small, round about, let me, that's about a tenth of a millimetre is the biggest you can get away with for light, all right? And I've never been able to hold anything quite that well. I was considering it, considering you're bringing a laser and doing all that, but... <coughs> right, now here comes the problem. You can do it with electrons. Now a Japanese group actually did this. What you're looking at is the back of the screen, and in fact what you're looking at is a computer image of the back of the screen, and you can see that individual electrons hit the screen, generate light, and the computer records where that light was. Now, this is um, quite a long experiment, because what they did at this point, this proves electrons are little bullets, little particles. Yeah? Brilliant. They all think marvellous, and they go for lunch. And all they're discussing is, this is going to be a great paper for nature. We're going to have our names in lights. We have proved the electron is a particle, no worries. Unfortunately, the computer is still taking data. And you can see, I mean, by, so anybody else at this point hear a sort of faint music in the background, the words, space, the Bible prompt. <laughs> and they just kept taking data like this, and they, when it came back, it was looking fairly complicated, but still fairly random. But they decided to let it run, and that was their undoing. You can see things get brighter and brighter, you get more and more electrons piling on top of one another, Below me, you get the interference pattern. Constructive interference, destructive interference, constructive, destructive. Now, 
This gives us a problem. Here's your experiment. Here's your little electron gun. You saw at the beginning of that film clip how slowly they're coming through. There is only one electron at once. And the electron, by the way, is part of an atom, and your atoms make up you. So technically, we can get a bit of you and do this experiment with you. <laughs> you fire the electron out of the gun, which is a doggle. It's called a the back end of a TV tube. And let's say it fires out at an angle. Unclick that button. <laughs> there you go, back one. <laughs> All right, that's not that. It doesn't exist. Press B. Alright. Excellent. Alright. Let's say it's an angle that goes through this hole. That's fine. Maybe it bounces off the slide wall and changes direction. That's okay. It's still a particle. It's like a little bullet. Trouble is, if you think about it, in order to reproduce that experiment you've just seen on a piece of uh, film, when it comes through the other side, it has to decide where on the screen to hit to generate the interference fringes, those bands of dark and light. In other words, in going through that hole, the electron knows that hole is there. Now, I don't know about you, but an electron is so small, it's, you know, it's about, well, even if you think, consider it to be a pure particle, it's about the millionth of the size of an atom. It doesn't have the brain cells to know there's another hole. <laughs> but it knows there's another hole. So that when it comes through, it goes, hang on a minute, Fred's going to come through the other way in a minute, we want to make sure that the bands line up, so I'll cut the strip and it's through. There is only one electron at once, they're not communicating with one another. But they know there's another hole. Now just to get really clever, what you can do is put a little shutter over this hole. This is what the Japanese do, because at this point they're getting worried. Because they've just proved that the electron is both the way and the particle. You put a little shutter in, and you can play around with this. They did numerous experiments. One of the things you can do is keep the shutter closed, except for the very, very short period of time when the electron is going through a hole. So you can have it closed. So if you like, the electron, if it's got brains and an eye, which presumably it must know to know there's another hole, when it comes out of here and there is no hole, as it goes through there, there is a hole, and as it's on the other side, there isn't a hole because the shutter's closed again. Do you know what? It still knows. It still gives you the wave pattern. <clears throat> Just to make things even worse, you can put a little detector in here and watch the electron to find out which hole it goes through. <coughs> it knows. The minute you have a detector there that's live, what you see on the screen is classical, just the dots in any old random position. You don't get the interference fringes. If you turn the detector off to go for lunch, when you come back, you get that wave pattern again. <laughs> It knows whether the, de the detector is on. I mean, I don't know if it's the sort of detector that has a little red flashing LED on top, like a security camera or whatever, but it knows. It knows about the, the fact that there is a hole there, and even worse, it knows that you're watching. Now, the electron's a peculiar thing, but we, you can do this experiment with more than just electrons. So far, we've done it with... Go on in. We've done Young's experiment backwards. We slowed down the number of photons, and you can get individual photons going. And they still behave, you do the shutter thing, what have you. They still know there's another hole. <coughs> so, do you mind? That's salt to you and me. Now, we're really talking about lumps of matter now. Yeah? Ordinary salt, or at least half of it, you can spray it out. And you can do the whole thing with the shutters and the doors, and it knows. And it... Worse, 18 months ago, somebody published a paper where they actually did this with C60. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, clap applause. <laughs> <laughs> Say that, because I know. Um, let's, let's put the correct name up, please. Is that ringing bells? <coughs> yeah? The tabloid is known as buckyballs. Okay? Now, let's have a quick look at the diagram of the buckyball. All it is is a football, I mean, wherever you have the patches joining, you would have a carbon atom. So there's six carbon atoms around there, another one there, another one there, another one there, another one there. I checked, by the way, I'm such a sad person who actually <laughs> works out that you should be able to see 30 carbon atoms on that half of the ball, there's another 30 on the other side. This, this thing is huge as a molecule. It's getting close to the size of a virus. But you can do a double slit experiment with it, and it will behave as a wave, not a lump of matter which seriously, I mean, it doesn't keep me awake at night because I just go, forget it, you know? Like, 
transmuting human beings into energy which you then beam from one planet up to a certain uh, starship and then reassemble all the bits in the right order. That's a doddle! You try to... <laughs> this in comparison is peculiar. So, really, there is a moral to this story, and it's this. The truth may well be out there, but... <laughs> Thank you very much. I hate to say this, but I will try and answer questions. This is not my area of specialism, but we'll, we'll have a go. Anything I can't answer, I'll ask you. <laughs> He's a physicist, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do waves behave like waves? Yeah, waves behave like waves. Oh, surely they're just particles of Yes. I'm waiting for someone to get water and get it to act as particles and waves, and there's no reason why they shouldn't, because something as big as that. Yeah? Um, the waves in sort of, um, you know, a pond or something, then you're looking at assemblies, and you can almost see what's going on, the movement of one nudges another, and it... Yeah, so you can almost rationalise that. But down at single... Lumps of stuff. Surprise my brain. Yeah? If you have three holes, you shoot them two, mm -hmm. and you have an eye looking at that one hole it's going to go through. Yeah? And then there's some people who are like children, so they can't see it. Yeah? But they act like. I don't know if anybody's done that experiment, but my guess is there's a, you, you get a different pattern if you have three holes. It's more complicated, which I only did two. I mean, three holes is getting well complicated, four is just to get Alright? My guess is if you had your little eye next to one of the holes, the things that were going through would know it was there and only play like the other two holes were there. So you didn't know which one they went through. That is my guess. And just the way the world works and how weird it is, I think it's funny. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, they're too clever. They know. They tried everything. They literally painted it black, um, made it as small as possible taken them as far away as possible, but you can still just about make anything out. They know. And I don't know how they know, and nobody knows how they know. If a radio wave goes up, yes. a broadcast, yes. it's floating around in the air, in the atmosphere. I go on, am I right? It's actually floating around in the magnetic field. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? Why can we not get it back? We do. And that's why sometimes late at night you can get French radio stations much better than you can get radio uh, than the sound, for which we are all very grateful. <laughs> but, yeah, because what happens is at certain times um, when the atmospheric conditions are right, you can actually get a, an ionised layer and it bounces it. Most of the time, there's nothing in the way to make the bounce. Right. If the radio wave was sent in 1930 and is still floating around there, why can't we get it back? In theory. We can, and it's the sort of thing I think you probably could do, and I think we have the technology to do it. The trouble is the technology is terribly expensive, and they want to spend it on much more important things, like trying to find out how old the universe is. Because what the sort of level of radiation we're talking about is probably the stuff we're talking about when we talk about the Big Bang. If there was a Big Bang. If there was a Big Bang. If it. Yeah? I mean, I, I should now my colours to the mast here. As far as I'm concerned, unless we can do something, at least five times, especially ten times, in a lab, and watch it happen every time. It's not hard facts to me. It's a theory, or maybe a hypothesis. Yeah? And then, Maureen? I, I annoy my geology friends when I say this, but... Yeah? But I, I think the technology's there, but I'm not sure they would want to spend the time looking for it. I mean, certainly, presumably, it would bounce off your planet as well, to be able to capture that. With the uh, future proposed moon missions, yes. As a chemist, are you sort of looking forward to new and interesting things, or are they still find more rocks? Can I be honest with you? There are so many new things that are you can do using not much more than school laboratories. But to me, I'll sit in the fifth floor of the Davy Building and play around with my stuff. Because it actually happens there. 
and I don't have to wait for somebody to go and come back again. I accept that. I think the chances are we're not going to find anything new in the way of materials, which is, I mean, I'm a very peculiar person. I, all that stuff's interesting, yeah, fine. But what difference does it make today to what I can do for somebody else? You know, uh, or, or indeed me. Does it mean I can have my CDs even smaller? Or I can cure cancer? Or whatever? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, to use science for mankind. I think the chances of finding anything new that we could use like that on the moon are very slim. Having said that, there's a heck of a lot of blue sky research that people have done that has got no readily apparent um, use, like buckyballs. That's no point. What's the point of doing that? I mean, yeah, nowadays they are producing buckyballs uh, to produce very, very unusual lubricants to make the sort of machines we couldn't make five years ago. So, but I mean, there's not a lot of chemistry goes on in the moon, basically. Is the, moon, is the moon mission therefore really a scientific catalyst for other developments? More than, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I mean, if you, you know, the, the, the race to the moon, what has it generated? Spin dryers, um, take a lot of different materials for dealing with heat. Non-stick frying pans. Non-stick frying pans. I'll come to that. <laughs> Um, a whole host of stuff, yeah? Uh, not to mention the odd rubber grommet that doesn't quite work when you shift it. But yeah, I mean, most of the... You, you've got to specialise in one thing that really, you know, flips your switch. But you're forever looking out to either side to find out what's going on. And the bit of research I'm doing at the moment was sparked off because Kodak wanted a new film. I'm not the slightest bit interested in, in photography, I'm interested in sensing molecules, but I can use their technology in a slightly different way that they've never thought of and do something else with it. So if you're ever looking, keeping your eye open, like, whose idea can you meet next? So yeah, I think it's going to be something that, you know, the heck of a lot of spin offs. But how's. I'm going to really jump on all the oars here. How do you decide whether or not that's worth it financially? Just about every country, uh, every company in Britain now runs a uh, so-called research development arm where you can only get the money provided you prove it will pay back for itself in three years or less. Now when I joined British Gas many years ago, um, the same week as I joined, they were celebrating the fact that the process my boss had invented had actually come through to the scale of the first big plant. That took 13 years and everyone was amazed it was so quick. Nowadays, you've got to be able to justify it in three years, which is why a lot of, there is no real commercial R&D going on in this country, unfortunately. It gets off into a lot of this. But, coming back to your question, it's going to be a great spin-off. I'm, I'm really quite glad that there are some people out there who just go, it's silly, it's weird, let's do it, let's chuck money at it, because you don't know what's going to come back. Right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I better go and tidy up, I suppose. <laughs>